Hi, Dr. H here. Uh, this video will be our Unit 1 review, getting ready for the AP test. Uh, even though the test is a little bit different this year, I still think it's a good idea to have a good solid background in this beginning stuff uh, because you will probably have to know some of this stuff uh, to answer some of the questions posed uh, this year. So as you can see from the screen, the topics we'll go over, we'll do a very quick uh, basic chemistry review, uh, that's the elements of life. And then we'll look at some specific properties of water, uh, some things that make that a very unique uh, chemical and very important for life. And then we'll finish up with uh, some organic chemistry and the biological molecules. Introductory chemistry, uh, I don't really think we're going to see a whole lot of this uh, on this year's test, um, but again, it's a good place to start. Um, just remember that the elements are organized by the periodic table, um, and as far as atomic structure, just remember that in the center of the atom, we have the protons and neutrons, and orbiting around the outside, we have the electrons. And the electrons, of course, are what give the element its chemical uh, properties. So one big thing that we will focus on uh, in terms of the AP test is what type of chemical bonds uh, we might see in some of our biological molecules. And as I said earlier, these chemical bonds are formed by the atoms uh, and their electrons. So there's a few different types of chemical bonds that we will talk about. Uh, for right now, we're gonna talk about ionic bonds and covalent bonds. Uh, and the difference between these two uh, is really determined by the relative electronegativities of the two atoms. So when we're trying to determine what type of bond two atoms might, might form, uh, we just look at the individual electronegativities and find the difference. If the two atoms are very similar, then they, that would be a nonpolar covalent type bond. If the electronegativity difference is very large, uh, then we would probably see a uh, ionic type bond forming. So what is the difference between these two bonds? Uh, first, ionic bonds. Uh, again, this is two atoms that are very different in electronegativities, uh, and these bonds are formed through the transfer of electrons from one atom to the next. So here uh, we see in our example the formation of sodium chloride, where chlorine is a highly electronegative atom. Uh, sodium is a very low electronegative atom. So chlorine is actually able to strip the electron off of the sodium atom and the atoms then become ionized. Sodium now is positive because it lost the electron. Uh, chlorine is negative because it gained the electron. And now the positive and negative ions will stick to each other. Right? They are attracted, and that is the ionic bond. Uh, in terms of properties, uh, probably one of the most important properties of ionic compounds is they are very, very soluble in water. Right? And like I said, water is something that we will spend a little bit of time talking about uh, later in this video. So if the, uh, if the electronegativities are a little bit closer together, then the atoms will form uh, a covalent bond. And a covalent bond, instead of the electrons being transferred from one atom to the other, uh, the electrons are shared. And these shared electrons kind of hold the two atoms together in a very strong bond. So uh, covalent bonds, have two different types. Uh, we have nonpolar and polar covalent bonds. Uh, and again, this has to do with the electronegativity difference between the two atoms. If the electronegativity difference 
is very small or exactly the same, then we will have a nonpolar covalent bond. And in this type of bond, the electrons are equally shared between the two atoms. These, uh, an example of a, com a nonpolar compound would be something like a fat. A, this is full of carbon-carbon and carbon-hydrogen bonds, and these are all nonpolar. So in general, these nonpolar compounds are insoluble in water and right? they will not dissolve. Now, if the electronegativity difference is a little bit above what we see in the nonpolar bond, but not quite large enough where one atom can ionize the other, then we end up with a polar covalent bond. Okay? And in this case, uh, the atoms are still shared, but they are shared unequally the greater electronegative atom will pull the electron to it a little bit more, a little bit stronger than the less electronegative atom, so the electrons will spend more time orbiting that atom. So what ends up uh, with our uh, polar compound example here of water, uh, the more electronegative atom uh, becomes slightly negatively charged. Right? We see the partial negative charge there on the oxygen atom, and the hydrogen atoms uh, then become partially positively charged because they have the they don't have the electron around them as much. Um, polar compounds uh, are generally soluble in water, and like I said, we're going to talk a good bit about water um, before we get into water. I just want to touch a little bit on carbon uh, because that is another very important element for living things. Um, and it has the ability to form four covalent bonds with other atoms. Um, and it will readily form bonds with many, many other elements, which uh, is what gives organic chemistry such a wide variety of uh, chemicals. The shapes that carbon can make are also highly varied, and we will see examples of each of these when we get into the biological molecules. Right? They have chains of different lengths. Uh, carbons can form double bonds with each other. That is actually two covalent bonds, so two pairs of electrons being shared between two carbon atoms. Uh, the chains can be branched or uh, the carbon compounds can form ring structures, and we'll see lots and lots of ring structures when we get into our biological molecule review. But before we get into the biological molecules uh, and organic chemistry, I want to talk about uh, what is probably the most important inorganic molecule for living things, and that is water. Okay, as I said a few minutes ago, uh, water is a polar covalent molecule uh, because it has this very strong polar covalent bond between the oxygen and the hydrogen atoms. And the oxygen is highly electronegative, so it takes on a partial negative charge, and the hydrogens take on the partial positive charge. What these polar molecules like water can then do is form a an intermolecular bond, right? A weak chemical bond between multiple molecules called hydrogen bonds. Okay? And these hydrogen bonds are due to the partial negative oxygen on one water molecule being attracted to the partial positive hydrogen on a diff on a different water molecule. So here we see uh, this complex of five water molecules all attracted to each other and held together by these hydrogen bonds. And these hydrogen bonds are super important for the properties of water. Right? All of the properties of water that we're going to touch on are due to these hydrogen bonds forming. Um, and just as a reminder, water is, of course, not the only polar covalent substance. Uh, any polar molecule has the ability to form these hydrogen bonds. Uh, and here we see um, an example of water uh, with another polar covalent compound, ammonia, 
forming our hydrogen bond. In this case, uh, in the case of ammonia, it is nitrogen that is the highly electronegative atom that has the negative charge uh, along with the hydrogens, again, that have the partial positive charge. So all of these emergent properties of water, all of these unique properties of water are all due to this, these hydrogen bonds forming between the water molecules. What is an emergent property? Uh, an emergent property uh, happens at in every biological system uh, when we have these increasing layers of complexity. So whenever we take simple structures and put them together in certain ways, that resulting more complex structure has new properties that were not readily apparent in these simple structures. So all of these examples here on the screen, all of these levels, when we go up one, all exhibit emergent properties. For example, if we take a cell, we can really, really well understand how a cell works. But once we put all those cells together into a tissue and make this new structure, the tissue will have new properties. It will behave in new ways that the individual cells did not. Okay, in every single step along the way here, we would, we would see some of these emergent properties. So in terms of water, again, like I said, all of these emergent properties are all due to water's ability to form these hydrogen bonds. Okay, the water is a very strong polar molecule and the water molecules all are attracted to each other through these hydrogen bonds, right? The positive hydrogen uh, uh, end of the molecule is attracted to the negative oxygen end of a different water molecule. So you see the list over on the side here of the important emergent properties of water. I am not going to go through all of these uh, because I don't feel as though it's uh, worth the time in this video, uh, but certainly if you need a, a little refresher on this, uh, go back and look these emergent properties over. Okay, one important property of water that I am going to take some time to go over here is pH. Okay, and pH uh, is a measure of the ionization of water. So what happens is uh, water can actually ionize itself. Uh, two water molecules coming together, uh, one will lose one of its hydrogen ions and another water molecule will pick that up. So we end up with a positive ion, the hydronium ion, and a negative ion, the hydroxide ion. And pH is the measure of the balance between these two ions and which one is in greater concentration. So in a perfectly neutral solution of pure water, uh, the concentration of hydrogen or, hydrox or hydronium ions and hydroxide ions will be equal, and that will be our neutral solution. If the hydroxide ions increase in concentration, then we have a basic solution. If the hydrogen ions become in excess, then we move towards an acidic solution. And the way we measure this is with our pH scale. Okay, the pH scale runs from 0 to 14, uh, with 7 right in the middle being exactly neutral. That is where hydrogen and hydroxide ion concentrations are equal. As the pH gets lower, so from seven down to zero, that is increasing in acidity, where the hydrogen ion concentration is greater than the hydroxide ion concentration. And then as the pH rises above seven and goes up towards 14, that is increasing in uh, alkalinity, or, and it is becoming more basic, and that is where the, the hydroxide ion concentration is becoming greater than the hydrogen ion concentration. The formula to calculate pH uh, 
uh, is the negative log base 10 of the hydrogen ion concentration. Uh, this formula will be provided to you on the formula sheet. Uh, I do not think you will need to actually use this formula on the AP test. Uh, one thing that you will need to recognize though is because it is a log base 10 uh, formula, that means that for every one increase in the pH, there is a tenfold change in the, in the hydrogen ion concentration. So as we go from pH 4, let's say, to pH 3, that the hydrogen ion concentration increased by tenfold. If we went from pH 4 to pH 2, that is a hydrogen ion concentration increase of 100-fold. Okay, every one step on the pH scale is a tenfold change in the ionization of the water. Okay, so that wraps it up for water. And now we'll move on to our last topic, which is the biological molecules. And these molecules, these are the large uh, carbon-based molecules that perform all of the essential cellular functions. Uh, remember that carbon uh, can form four covalent bonds and can do all make all kinds of interesting shapes and we will certainly see all of these as we go through these molecules and as I believe I also said uh, carbon is able to form bonds with other elements other atoms uh, and we will see some of these functional groups here uh, containing oxygen containing nitrogen and sulfur and phosphorus we will see these groups in our biological molecules. Uh, I do not think it's worth your time to try to memorize the structure of these molecules and the names, um, but just be aware that they will be, we will see these on our carbon skeletons and they do change the properties of the, of the organic molecules. So most of our bio biomolecules that we're going to talk about have this have a monomer polymer type structure, meaning that the molecules are long chains or polymers built up of smaller subunits, the monomers. And as we go through the four uh, main molecule main types of biological molecules, it will be very important that you remember what is the monomer for each of these and what is the polymer called. Um, when we are putting these polymers together or taking the polymers apart back into the monomer form, uh, there are certain chemical reactions that are important. Um, the reaction that builds up a polymer is called a dehydration reaction. Uh, and it is called that because when we put a monomer together to form a large polymer, uh, a molecule of water is created as a byproduct. So this water is coming out, so we call it a dehydration reaction. To break a polymer apart back down into its monomer subunits, then the reaction is exactly the opposite, and it is called a hydrolysis reaction. In this case, instead of water coming out and being a byproduct, water is used up, it is put into the reaction, and the monomers are broke the, the polymers are broken apart and the monomers are released. Okay, so let's start going over these four main categories. They are carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, and nucleic acids. So we'll start with carb carbohydrates. Uh, some general properties uh, for the most part. These are very water soluble, um, especially the smaller ones uh, will taste very, very sweet. And the general chemical formula is uh, a carbon with uh, water molecules added to it and the ratio of carbon to water should be about one to one. Uh, structurally, here are some uh, examples of carbohydrate formulas. Uh, 
uh, three, five, and six uh, carbon sugars. Um, certainly don't think you need to memorize any names or any structures, uh, but we can certainly see uh, the carbon and water uh, relationship here. Structurally, the monomers for carbohydrates are called monosaccharides, that literally means single sugar. Uh, and then the polymers, uh, if we have two monomers, two monosaccharides put together, that gives us a disaccharide. If we have many, many monosaccharides linked together, then we get a polysaccharide. And here is an example of a dehydration reaction uh, linking two monosaccharides together. We see our water molecule coming out and the resulting disaccharide there. As far as the polysaccharides, uh, that is when we have many, many monosaccharides linked, like hundreds of them all linked together. Um, we see a couple examples here. Um, and for the function of these monos of uh, carbohydrates, uh, the monomers uh, can be used for very quick energy. Uh, the polysaccharides, some of them are used as a short-term energy storage. Uh, it's not a terribly efficient form of energy storage. Um, and there are also a few structural polysaccharides, such as uh, the cellulose found in the plant cell walls. Our next uh, biological molecule are the lipids. Uh, in general, these are highly water insoluble, uh, mainly consisting of carbon and hydrogen. Uh, so there's a lot of these nonpolar covalent bonds. Um, there will be a few oxygens mixed in, but certainly predominantly carbon and hydrogen. Uh, the lipids are unique in that they are not strictly a monomer uh, polymer type structure. Uh, here we see an example of a lipid. We have our fatty acid chain. We see our nice long chain of carbon and hydrogen atoms. And that is being linked to a molecule of glycerol. And we see our de dehydration reaction again. Though it's not technically a polymer made up of smaller subunits, we do still see uh, this dehydration reaction. So a little bit more about the structure of lipids. Uh, one of the very common uh, lipids that we'll see is a triglyceride uh, because again, we have our glycerol molecule over there in gray and we have three fatty acids attached to it. Okay, and these would all have been linked together through our dehydration reaction. One thing that we need to look at when we're looking at uh, the structure of these, uh, of these fats is are there carbon-carbon double bonds within our fatty acid chain? If there are no carbon double bonds, if it's all single bonds, then we have what is called a saturated fat. And... These saturated fats are generally solid at room temperature because these unsaturated fatty acids can all pack very tightly together and form a solid. If there are double bonds between a few of the carbons in our fatty acid chain, then we would have what is called an unsaturated fat. Okay? And in this case, uh, we see here one of our fatty acids has this double bond, so that introduces a little bend in the fatty acid chain, and that is going to prevent these unsaturated fats from packing in very tightly together, and that will keep these unsaturated fats as liquids at room temperature. Some other uh, important structural uh, features of fatty or structural examples of fatty acids. Uh, we have phospholipids. In uh, for phospholipids, we have two fatty acids attached to the glycerol, and that third spot in the glycerol molecule has a polar group attached to it. We see the phosphate group there with our phosphorus atom and some charged, uh, a charged oxygen on it. So that is going to be a polar region. Uh, and we'll see these again 
when we get into cell membrane structure. Um, another important structural, um, another important type of lipid are the steroids. Okay? And these are formed from four uh, fused carbon rings. They look very different from all the other lipids. Um, they're classified as lipids because they are water insoluble, which is one of the basic properties of lipids. So in terms of functioning, uh, lipids work very well for long-term energy storage. There's a lot of energy that can be packed into all of these carbon-carbon bonds. Um, because they are insoluble in water, that makes them very good for waterproofing and for insulating cells and organisms. Uh, the steroid-based lipids are used for signaling. Uh, here we see a couple examples of steroid-based uh, hormones from humans. Um, and as I mentioned before, the phospholipids are used to build the cell membranes. We have our phospholipid bilayer, uh, which we'll get into in the next unit. Okay, uh, let's see. Group three will be our proteins. Some general features here. Um, atomically, they will have, of course, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen. Uh, they will have a good bit of nitrogen mixed in. Um, and we can see some small amounts of sulfur and phosphorus also mixed into the proteins. Um, structure and function is highly variable. Okay, And those two things, of course, will go together very, very tightly. Okay, the structure of the protein is going to determine its function, and the function of that protein is going to affect its structure. Okay, and we'll talk a good bit about protein structure here, um, starting with the monomers and the polymers. So the monomer of a protein are the amino acids. So here is a general diagram of amino acids. Uh, they have two different functional groups, uh, the amino group with the uh, nitrogen atom and the carboxyl group with the two oxygen atoms bound to the carbon atom. And then coming off, uh, off the top there of the picture is the R group, the side chain. Okay, And this is what's going to be different in each of our 20 common amino acids. Right? Each one of these amino acids has a different side chain, and they, each of these side chains uh, will give slightly different properties to that amino acid. Okay, here we have them all categorized based on chemical properties, uh, whether they are hydrophobic and nonpolar, or hydrophilic and polar. Uh, we have some acidic and some basic amino acids. So all of these different side chains will give the protein different chemical properties at that spot. So again, putting these monomers together, we have our dehydration reaction here, uh, adding an amino acid to our existing chain, and we see our water molecule coming out. Okay, so this sequence of amino acids that we have for our protein, this is the first of four levels of protein structure. Okay, and this is what we call the primary structure. Okay, just the sequence of amino acids, which ones are there and in what order. So here our example protein is called transthyretine and we have our 127 amino acids listed here. So this is the primary structure. Okay. These, uh, this backbone of amino acids will then fold up on itself in one of a couple ways. Okay. It will either form a spiral and that will be called an alpha helix, or it will kind of arrange itself kind of flat and folding up and down like a fan, and that is what we call the beta sheet. Okay, and this alpha helix or beta sheet, this these are examples of the secondary structure. This is the second level of protein structure. Okay, these alpha helices or beta sheets will then interact with each other, right? The, the side chains, the R groups will start to interact with each other, and that will form the third level of protein structure called the tertiary structure. Okay? And most proteins will then stop there. 
right? The tertiary structure will be the highest level of protein structure, and that would then be the functional protein. But there are a good number of proteins that actually go up to a fourth level of structure called the quaternary structure. And proteins that have quaternary structure are made up of multiple separate protein chains. Okay, so our transthyretine protein here uh, looks like it is made up of four separate subunits. So we need all four of those separate subunits of those separate protein chains to all come together to make the functional protein. Okay, so primary, secondary, tertiary, quaternary structure, all of these are important to be correct for the protein to have its actual final function. If a protein loses its structure, it will lose its function. Okay? And this loss of protein structure is called de denaturation. Okay? When we denature a protein, we, take a, we blow apart its quaternary, tertiary, and secondary structures. Okay? For the most part, we will leave the primary structure, we'll leave the actual amino acid chain intact, but we've taken out all of those higher levels of structure. So a denatured protein, since it no longer has its structure, it can no longer perform its function. Okay. The most common way to denature a protein is through heating. If you heat a protein up, it will break apart all of these higher levels of structure and the protein will lose its function. As far as function of proteins, uh, pretty much everything that a cell does is carried out by proteins. Uh, the most important thing to remember here is the structure-function relationship. A structure has to be correct for a protein to perform the correct function. And here we see a great example of that uh, with our antibody protein, its structure matching up exactly with the protein from a flu virus that it is that it has evolved to detect and bind to. Okay, so structure function, very, very important. Um, as far as what proteins do in the cell, um, they pretty much do everything, right? So there's really no reason to go in and try to memorize this whole list. Just know if a cell is doing something, it's probably being done by a protein. Okay, so, that brings us to our final uh, biological molecule, and these are the nucleic acids. Um, as the name implies, they are slightly acidic, uh, first found in the nucleus, and uh, similar to proteins, they have carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen, uh, but they also have a large amount of phosphorus uh, in the structure. I'm not gonna talk too much about nucleic acids here, um, because we get into these in much more depth in a later unit. Um, so as far as structure, uh, the monomer of the nucleic acids are the nucleotides. Uh, here we see a general nucleotide structure with the three pieces, uh, the phosphate group, uh, the five carbon sugar, and then the nitrogenous base, which you know, it's one of the five uh, bases. These are all linked together into a linear chain, and that is the nucleic acid, right? And they will, would all have been linked together, of course, through our dehydration reactions. In terms of the function of these nucleic acids, uh, DNA functions in the information storage, and RNA functions as information retrieval, getting that information out of the DNA and directing the proteins to be made for the cell to function. Okay, so that is it for unit one. Uh, like I said, I'm not sure how much of this will directly show up on the test this year, but I do think it's important that we have this good basis of understanding. So I hope that all made sense, and I hope to see you guys soon.